So I came over to Go as a systems programmer from C Sharp on the Microsoft platform. And at the time, we were developing products on the Microsoft side, and I started to put bids together that ended up giving Microsoft more money than myself, which was really, really depressing. So we realized very quickly we had to move over to Linux, and I needed a programming language that would allow me to do what I was doing on the Microsoft side. And uh, thank God I found Go. It's been awesome. And when I first looked at Go, I think like everybody does, they see channels, and they're like, you know, everybody comes to Go for channels, and then they discover inheritance, type embedding, and all their constants are actually my favorite thing in Go. But you all come to, you come to channels, and when I first saw channels, I said, look at this really cool synchronous queue. That was in my head, that this was a synchronous queue, and I can do things with it to make Go routines, uh, you know, synchronize activity. And I started writing code, and I realized very quickly that the code I was writing based on this philosophy wasn't working. And it's that same thing. If the code just starts to seem a little more complicated than it should be, you're probably doing something wrong. So I asked a bunch of people in the community, what am I doing wrong here? And I got the answer. Now the best way to give you the answer here, this idea of a guarantee, as the channel provides a guarantee, is to tell your story. So I'm about to go to work, and my wife hands me an envelope. And she says, Bill, I need you to give this envelope to your partner, Ed. He's got to get to his wife tonight. And like a good husband, I said, no problem, honey. Just give me the letter. Not a big deal. So I take the letter, I go to work, it's 5 o'clock, and what happens? I forgot I had the letter. So I rush over to Ed's desk. His laptop is there, he's obviously still at work, but he's missing his desk. No big deal, but I gotta leave, my son's got, got sports. I take the letter, I put it on Ed's desk, on his laptop, and I walk away and I go home. So I get home, my wife goes, did you give Ed the letter? Yeah, honey, I gave him the letter. You gave him? Yeah, I gave him. She gives me a nice kiss. Nice life is good. I'm laying on the couch about an hour later, and all of a sudden I hear in the back of my head. What are you, honey, what's wrong? You didn't give Ed the letter. I gave Ed. You didn't give? I gave it to him. And why does his wife not have it? Oh. So I immediately call Ed. Ed, you got that letter I left for you, right? No. Now I'm in trouble. To me, this story describes very well what a buffered channel is. This is a buffered channel. Okay? I put the letter in the buffer. It was put in the buffer. I walked away, assuming that there was somebody on the other end of that buffer that was going to get the letter. The problem is, who was still responsible for that envelope? I was. I was still responsible for it until I knew Ed had it in his hands. So this is what I love about the unbuffered channel. It provides that guarantee. A guarantee that data from this Go routine has been received by this other Go routine that the responsibility for this piece of data or this message has gone through, right? And with that guarantee gives you a lot of consistency and some predictability in your code. I really love the idea of responsibility and guarantee. Now I remember when object-oriented programming became the really big thing and this idea that everybody promised that, oh, with object-oriented programming, we can now model the real world. Yeah. Right? We can take all the boxes and lines on our whiteboards that we've been drawing for years and make them come to life. Except one problem. I could model those boxes, right? I can model the real world. I can define the data and the methods. But when the code ran, did it really run like things in the real world? No because all the synchronization we had to do, all the things we had to do to make, in our case, threads at the time really interact properly, couldn't be done. The other thing I really love about 
unbuffered channels. And the idea of responsibility and guarantee is that for the first time, I was able to write code that really mimicked the real world without all of the extra stuff around it. I'm going to show you a piece of code we're going to go through. It's a relay race, just like we would see in the Olympics, using an unbuffered channel. And I'm going to walk through the code, and you're going to see, just by reading the code, you can imagine, you can picture the runners getting on the track. You can see the batons being handed off. We can see that responsibility and that guarantee. Because in a relay race, there's responsibility, right? The person running on the track has the baton. That is their responsibility. The next person cannot start running until what happens? There's a guarantee that that baton handed off. And then the race can continue. We can model this exactly using channels, using the unbuffered channel. This is what I love about the unbuffered channel. I love that idea. Once I started looking at things as responsibility and guarantee and not wanting to walk away from that guarantee, my use of channels got much easier in my code. So I want to show you, hopefully you guys can see. Let's see a little code here. Can you guys see that? I, I was going to have it on a white screen and if I can get a little bigger. Everybody can see that? All right, cool. I want to walk through this code, and I want you to try to imagine the runners on the track. I want you to look at the responsibility and the guarantees that are happening in this code. So we start off with a weight group. A weight group is a, it's a, it's a counting semaphore. It's go routine safe. It's going to allow us to keep track of the go routines that are in this program. Because when you're writing code, I really believe that you should write your programs to shut down cleanly. You should always be focused on programs shutting down cleanly. I do that right from the very beginning. So I've got my weight group. And right here we are creating a unbuffered channel. It's just an integer. The baton is going to be an int. We're going to keep track of all the handoffs. And this is going to be our way of guaranteeing each runner running, running down the track. At this point, we're going to have one go routine in the race. And during a race, how many runners are on the track at any given time on your team? Just one. So that's going to represent right now that runner on the track. Then we're going to send our runner onto the track. There he goes on the track. We're using the keyword go to launch our go routine, giving them the channel. And then we start the race. What's really important is that we want to make sure that that go routine, that runner is on the track before we start the race. Right? With a channel, with an unbuffered channel, what happens? If there's a, 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 a send that's going to happen on that channel, can that send complete unless there's someone on the other side to receive? No. That's the guarantee. Right? That's what we're looking for, that guarantee of exchange. Same thing on the other side. Can the send happen, right, if there isn't someone, it's that same guarantee. And so it's really important to make sure that there's a go routine on the other side already in a receive state before we perform this send. But forget about that for a second because we're trying to model the real world, right? That runner has to be on the track before the race can start. The runner is on the track. Now the gun goes off, we do the send. And now the main go routine is going to wait until the race is over. The very first thing that the runner does is goes into a receive. Here's the receive. So main is on the send. Here now this go routine is on the receive. An exchange now takes place. I like to think main was like the, the field judge handing the baton to the first runner. So now that the first runner has it, the runners, we can now imagine right here, the runner is going down the track. And we're going to check right here if this is the last runner in the race. If it's not the last runner in the race, we're just incrementing this count so we can keep track of all the runners. But look at what's happening here. Once that runner's off and going, the next runner comes out onto the track. Right? The next runner has to be there, in their lane, now waiting 
for their teammate to come all the way back around. When this go routine gets launched, we have two go routines now running, but this go routine immediately goes into a receive back on line 42. So now we've got a go routine waiting and a receive. We've got this other go routine running around the track. We can see this in the code. We pretend that it takes uh, 100 milliseconds for the run. We're checking to see if this is the fourth runner. It's not right now. And then here on line 69, at the bottom there, I don't know if you guys can see it, on line 69, the, ru the runner, that first runner, has gotten around the track and is ready to do the handoff. All right? But we have a go routine already in the receive. But this is a race, right? That receive, that's, that exchange has to be a guarantee. And it happens. So the send goes. Now there's a receive. The receive happens. And once this send is over, this, fun this go routine terminates. All right? We're not in an endless loop here. Just like in a real relay race. The handoff is over, and the runner walks off the track. At that point... We know that this has happened because that's synchronized. There's a guarantee between that send and the receive. And now the next runner goes. And we do this. And we can see this in the code. There isn't all this extra hoopla of synchronization objects from the operating system and other things. It's the channel guarantee allowing us to mimic finally the real world. Now what happens when the fourth runner is running? Well, at this point, we just decrement the weight group this go routine comes off the track, and the race is over. You see the guarantee that how that channel gave us, the way we're able to mimic the real world. Finally, for me, the whiteboard came to life in the code. Right? Came to life. Now, I'm not saying at all that you can't have, you can't use a buffered channel with a guarantee. You can. Okay? There are ways to leverage buffered channels with a guarantee. But when I start writing concurrent code like this, I always start working with my unbuffered channels. I always start with there. And one reason is because, well, there's two reasons, really. One, if I'm going to use a buffered channel, there better be a reason you're choosing the number for the buffer. Just don't go like this. I've seen code where somebody goes, uh, 10,000. Why is the buffer 10,000? Because I'm never going to hit it. Cool. Great. And then what happens? They get really lucky. And they wake up because their, their website was on Hacker News. And the traffic hits right some crazy amount. And their system goes, Bruh. Well, what happened? Well, the buffer got full and everything else behind it crashed. Right. Because you coded this with the idea that I wanted to use a channel as a queue that could never get full. Okay? No. If they used the unbuffered channel first and dealt with the pushback. I love the idea of pushback. Right? Every system has a breaking point. I don't care how well you write the software, there's at some point where the system just will not function. It is your job as programmers to know where that is. Not to correct it, because at that point you can't. It's to know, so you can monitor that. Know how the system needs to grow. Know where that is. Maybe to help improve it over time. But you need to know. But it's that pushback that lets you deal with those situations. Right? I'm one person. I like to think of a go routine as a person. I just showed you in a relay race. I can only do what I can do. Right? So if I'm moving boxes and you want to throw 100 boxes at me and I can't handle them, does that make any sense? It's the same thing. I see this as the same thing. Okay? If I can only handle one box at a time and you want to give me three, because what happens when I take that box? What if I started buffering all of the boxes that you gave me. Every time I take a box from you, who's responsible for that box? I am. I don't want that responsibility. I'm not ready to work on it. 
And really, I'm lying to you, right? I just took this box from you. When I took it from you, you were already thinking what? Well, I'm working on this. I got it. But am I really? No. And so the one thing I always think about with buffer channels is that when something gets put into it, I have to be willing to lose it. Am I willing to lose the data that's in that buffer? Because once it's in there, not only am I still responsible for it, I have no idea if it's ever going to come out the other end. I have no idea. Now, if you're doing page counts on a system where you can lose X number a day, maybe, maybe it's okay, but what's the size of your buffer? You better give me a really good answer. Right? But like I said, once you build your algorithms, once you build your software that's working really well with that unbuffered channel, with the pushback, with the responsibility and the guarantees, then you can start looking at, if we put a buffer here, what's going to happen? Will I get any better performance? Am I willing to lose this data? Because then, at least you know, at that point, if that buffer gets full, you can handle everything else that's happening behind it. If something bad happens, I'm willing to lose that data. That's, then it's fine. That's what I want to see in a code review. That's what I want to hear people telling me about. So that's really what I want to share with you. When, I, when I'm looking at code, I try to teach, forget about the syntax for a second. Forget about the mechanics of how the channel works. Forget about the mechanics of things. I want you to look at it in terms of what are you trying to accomplish here? What are we trying to do? Right? Then you can look up how do I do that. Okay? I want to do that. Oh, how do I do that in this language as opposed to another language? So I'm always looking for angles on things like this. So again, that whole idea of what is a channel providing? It's providing a way of accountability on responsibility and the guarantee that this piece of data, this thing, has moved from one go routine to the next. I can talk more. It's good enough. The floor is still yours. <laughs> I mean, I can, yeah, I mean, we can, we that's can. the general message. I mean, I can show you another program, which is a t I use in my class, which is a tennis game, right? Think of a tennis game. What happens in a tennis game? It's a back and forth, right? Well, I'll show you this code here. And keep your questions ready. All right. and this code's a little different than the other one. Because in a tennis game, we're going to have two players already on the court, right? Again, the idea is this isn't real world code, but it's showing you how you can use an unbuffered channel to deal with both that responsibility and that guarantee, right? That you can build in your real world applications. So the same on buffer channel, we've got this time two go routines, two players coming on the court, Serena and Venus. They're both now on the court. And the judge hands the ball to one of the two go routines. So here's something else that's really important. I've run this code enough to know right now that Serena, the first go routine, is going to probably get the ball, but I should not assume that. Right? The scheduler could decide anything that the scheduler wants. So one of the things I tell people as well is when you're dealing with a concurrent program, multiple go routine program, assume and think that every go routine is running at the same time. If I got 100 go routines that I've launched, I pretend that I got a 100 core machine and they're all running at the same time. When I do that, I get myself out of trouble. If you're thinking everything's running, then you're going to deal with that situation. If you think, well, I'm only on one thread, so it's all going to be concurrent, and you start trying to code around that. Because when you have bugs in this type of concurrent software, they will appear random. 
for a long time. We had a bug in one place I worked. It was three years. Multi-threaded bug for three years. It took three years for them to find it. Because it just looked random. But once they identified what it was, it was like, of course. Hmm? You want to take a question? Yeah. Well, let me just finish. I'll just run through this code run real quick it? since Perfect. I started. And then we'll take questions. Perfect. So real quick then. So we've got the endless for loop, right? These players are going back and forth until this game is over. So we're in an endless for loop. We've got two go routines going. And now both of them in the beginning went into this receive. Scheduler is going to choose one of the other. Let's just say it choose Serena. So Serena gets the ball, and now Venus is still here, right? So Venus is like this, ready to go. And uh, what did I say? I said Serena got the ball. So Venus is like this. And Serena now has the ball. We just choose some random number to determine whether or not she missed it or not. Let's say she didn't miss it. We increment the ball. And now we can see Serena hitting the ball back, right? There's the send. But Venus is already here on the receive. And so that unbuffered channel provides that guarantee. And Serena then goes into a receive. And now Venus has the ball. That guaranteed, right? That guaranteed exchange. Now let's just say here that uh, Venus misses the ball. So Serena's in a receive, right? That receive cannot end until there's something to, to be received on. But Venus just missed the ball. She's not going to be hitting it back over the fence, right? Over the net. What Venus just did is closed, closed, closed that channel. So this is really cool. If there's a channel that everyone's on a receive on, and you close it, the receives all get released. It's like a system-wide notification, right? But look how we're using this mechanism. Once this channel is closed, Serena is no longer waiting for the ball that's going to return. Notice I'm looking for the ball, but I also have a flag called OK. If actual data is received on this unbuffered channel, then OK will be true. But if it's being returned because of a closed channel, OK will be false. And so now both go routines return, and the game is over. So this example is showing two go routines going at it, right? And then the use of the close to provide that notification that, hey, we're all done. It's time to move on. But again, it's still the old idea that there's a guarantee, there's responsibility, and to build your software, your concurrent software, with that in mind. 